tutorial. Uh, my name is David Black. I'm from EMC. I'm, among other things, chair of the Transport Area Working Group and chair of the Storage Maintenance Working Group. And I'm Brian Trammell, uh, chair of IPPM, uh, and also on the IAB. Okay, so a little bit of background on what the transport area is. Uh, it covers a range of technical uh, topics related to data transport and the internet. I'm gonna show you exactly what that is uh, in a slide or two. Primarily, that means protocol design and maintenance at layer four. This is TCP, UDP, SCTP, and friends. What are the protocols that actually haul the data around? Um, they, they, they tend to need work done on them. The internet is a dynamic living system. The protocols are dynamic uh, living protocols, and every so often we have to do something about them. Uh, congestion. Buffer bloat. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this under active queue management. This is the latest thing that's going on in equipment out there that's making networking do things you weren't expecting. We cover quality of service related signaling protocols. For example, differentiated services and uh, maintenance work on, on RSVP, which is a signaling protocol for quality of service. And then there's some activities that are in uh, transport because they seem like a good idea at the time. Storage activities are here in part because storage moves a lot of data. Protocols that move a lot of data need to get the transport aspects right. Because you get them wrong, things go faster. Things go wrong faster and worse than with protocols that don't move a lot of data. Um, and so some of the stuff that, that, that's around here for historical reasons. Brian, any, any, any other opening remarks? No, go for it. Okay, so. It says up here, protocol design and maintenance at layer four. So what do we mean by layer four? How are we counting? What are we doing here? Okay, so this is my seven layer diagram. You will find seven layer diagrams to other people a little differently. You will find nine layer diagrams. If you see a nine layer diagram, layer eight is financial, layer nine is political. If you hear someone around here, around here talk about a layer nine problem, now you know what they're talking about. So these are the, the, the layers. We, it ranges from physical layer, the fiber wires, all the way up to the application. So rather than talk about this and get in the abstract, let's take a real example. Um, down at the bottom, fiber wires. If I plug this into the wall, probably cat 5E cable. Link, 100 megabit ethernet. Uh, up to the network layer. Now it starts to get interesting. This is where the IETF comes in. Internetwork, IP, which is a protocol that runs across all the links and uh, can do uh, networking across uh, link technologies. Uh, transport level, stream or message. I mean, message is the, is the uh, uh, colloquial term for datagram. Here it's TCP. We need a session protocol, HTTP, uh, data formats, HTML, and finally the web browser. So here's a whole stack that you'll see running inside, running inside a web browser. Or at least this is what's um, in the documents and probably what Brian teaches to his students. However, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't subscribe to that. So here's transport. We're right here, layer four, right above IP, right below the session protocols. So those things are interesting. Well, in case, some of the documents, what well, Brian probably teaches students, how the reality is a little bit different. Layer six, by and large, doesn't exist. Um, if you think about how networking works in practice, we can identify all layers up to um, the transport layer, the stream message protocol, be it uh, TCP, UDP, or SCTP. Um, there is a session protocol, which in practice is running the application. And beyond that, it goes straight to the application. It's very, very hard to separate out anything that happens that happens with the session protocol. So we're, we're concerned at the transport layer, we sit above the network protocol, which is IP before V6, and we sit below the session uh, protocol being the application. HTTP is one example. There are many, many others, like, uh, uh, like uh, RTP. And the other thing I want to point out here is that the internet is what's often referred to as an hourglass architecture. IP is the, is the, center, point of, the center or narrow point of, the, point of the hourglass. Everything runs over IP. IP runs, 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 runs over everything. Now, one of the things that's going on, and perhaps Brian and I will, will, will inject a few remarks sideways about this, is that that little neck of the hourglass is getting longer. 
Uh, we are seeing what Brian will talk about as ossification, where layer four is also now becoming part of that neck of the hourglass, where in practice you need to be running over one of a very small number of protocols at layer four to work in the internet with equipment deployed out there. Okay, so let's talk about um, where, where did we come from. So in the beginning there was TCP, well, sort of. Transport is one of the oldest areas in the IETF. In order to make the internet work, we had to have protocols that actually transport data around. Funny how that works. Um, so these are key internet elements. We started out with TCP, which is the Transport Control Protocol. That's a reliable uh, stream delivery protocol. And UDP, which is an unreliable datagram protocol. And we've got a few more. SCTP, uh, uh, which was originally uh, Simulant Control Transport Protocol. DCCP, Datagram Congestion Control Protocol, and in general, the transport area has sort of grown out of this. Our job is fundamentally to adapt technology to the internet, make things, a whole bunch of things, work over fundamentally unreliable packets. Oh, by the way, do it at large scale and with congestion control. Three examples uh, where we've done this are storage, pseudo wires, and multimedia. Uh, we'll probably talk a little bit about stories during this talk. Feel, 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 feel free to, add to, to ask us about, the, about uh, the other two or anything else we've done around here. So let's talk about uh, multimedia and the history of that for, for a little bit. So multimedia um, and the Rye area. Once upon a time, the conventional wisdom was, wait a minute, IP, your service model's best effort? That's a, that, that, that's a polite word for, that's a polite term for send and pray. Fundamentally unreliable. What do you mean you're going to get reliable service from these unreliable packets? Um, it's been disproved uh, and disproved in dramatic form. RTP, real-time real -time protocol, this is what's used for multimedia, and audio-video codecs were developed in the, early, in, in the early 1990s. These got good enough, and they've gotten much better since. Uh, the Rolling Stones uh, did, did a concert in Embone in 1994, and I think people vast, vastly enjoyed that. Since then, multimedia has broadened uh, to related work. IP telephony became an area that was related. Hey, if we, can do, if we can do a concert over IP, why not phone calls? This is a motiv mo motivation for both SCTP, which uh, was a protocol. Big, the number of motivations for SCTP, a big one is the TCP had a head of line blocking problem, and head of line blocking is a problem for telephony signaling. SCTP is actually a datagram protocol, recognizes multiple, uh, uh, multiple streams of datagrams inside a single, single protocol session and can, can avoid head of line blocking. Um, SIP, uh, which is session initiation protocol, is the primary signaling protocol that's used for IP telephony and now a number of other things. This all expanded to become a separate uh, RIE area, real-time applications infrastructure. Brian, you want to say anything else before we start talking about uh, today's world? Yeah, let's go. Okay, so that's a little bit of history um, and a little bit about uh, mo uh, multimedia, which is an adventure to RIE area. Let's talk about uh, where we are today. So, this is a trying to list everything we do on one slide. I guess it's sort of fit. We work on what, uh, what we'll call core transport protocols. These are TCP, SCTP, UDP, things like, th things like that, um, that actually are the key protocols at, uh, at layer four in the networking stack we showed you, showed you uh, a little bit earlier. A very important theme, congestion control and queue management. These aren't the same thing, but they interact. Congestion control, how a protocol responds to congestion in the network, interacts very strongly with how the network manages, manages its queues. So you wind up walking back and forth between what happens at the endpoints, what does congestion look like, how do you deal with it, with how are the queues managed in the network, and how do those two, how do those two, two interact to actually deliver a network that does useful things and doesn't undergo congestive collapse when you try to put 10, pound, 10, 10, 10 pounds of, of, of bleep in, uh, in, into a five pound sack. NAT traversal, network address, tra network address uh, translations, and UDP encapsulation uh, turn out to be related topics. These primarily involve layer four techniques for figuring out what on earth is going on. Most of what network address translators actually do today and what makes them interesting, which is a polite word for painful, is that they actually translate ports, which are a layer four concept in, in the transfer protocols. Quality of service and signaling uh, have historically been the transport area, still are. Uh, storage networking, and then 
ran out of ran ran, ran out of uh, uh, good first of bullet topics. There's a bunch of things that are here: delay tolerant networking, application level transfer optimization, and some incremental security improvements for TCP. That's sort of part of the core transport protocols, but it's, it's really digging in a in a related area that overlaps uh, transport and security. Let's start talking about what goes on with uh, the work on each e each of these uh, areas. So, core transport protocols. This is TCP, connection-oriented, uh, fully reliable stream. UDP, connectionless, unreliable, i.e., really, we, we call it best effort. By and large, your traffic gets through, but not all of it. And if you're absolutely positive counting on a particular packet uh, getting through, not your protocol. Uh, also referred to uh, informally as user space raw sockets with uh, port multiplexing. Then we have the datagram con uh, congestion Condition control protocol, which was the next thing that was done. UDP has no congestion control con control whatsoever. Datagram condition control protocol is connectionless, best effort, but it adds some congestion control functionality. So if DCCP is used, uh, you have some ability to re respond to congestion, some resistance uh, against uh, congestive collapse. SCTP, stream control transmission protocol, the S used to stand for signaling, it now stands for streams. Connection oriented, uh, I won't re read the whole slide. This was in essence the next generation of transport protocol designed to be better, th better than TCP. Avoid head of line blocking problems, allow treatment of individual streams inside, inside of a session, all, all, with, all with congestion control and de deal, uh, deal well with multi-homing. These are living protocols. They require ongoing maintenance, and in fact, it's enough that we have to have two working groups uh, that, that take part of this. TCP is, has its own working group for TCP maintenance. M maintenance on these other protocols, by and large, happens in TSVWG, the Transport Area Working Group. Hmm. Cool? So it's, yes, we're on, okay. Um, it's not just uh, the, the core protocols and the maintenance of them, we're also adding new features to them. So one of the ones we've been um, putting a lot of effort into recently is multipath TCP. And the idea here is basically you can take uh, TCP sessions across multiple interfaces and bind them together. Well, why would you want to do that? So here, yeah, wrong button, yes. Here's your cell phone, here's the server you're talking to, you're connected via a wireless, um, uh, uh, wireless, uh, so a Wi-Fi connection as well as a wireless base station, a 3G cell tower. Um, here we can actually bind these two interfaces so TCP sees a single connection over these two different, um, uh, these two different uh, lower layer connections. The reason to do this uh, is uh, for um, increasing uh, the available bandwidth as well as to sort of have failover when you're, you know, I mean, the, both of these uh, lower layers have wildly differing um, signal strength, wildly differing signal um, conditions, and if you have connectivity in both uh, cases, um, you can pull these together uh, in order to get a better uh, experience. So this is an experimental protocol. It was put together in RFC 6824 um, in the Multipath TCP Working Group. Um, actually, it came out of a research group, if I recall correctly. Um, so there's an experimental protocol for this right now, and there's current work for updates based on deployment experience. Um, so this uses a TCP option for signaling in band. So TCP, the header, has sort of uh, a set of um, uh, a set of header fields and then a set of optional header fields. And they've added the TCP option in order to be able to do, uh, or a couple of TCP options in order to be able, or a single TCP option with a couple of sub options, um, technically in order to be able to do the signaling that sets up and tears down these subflows on top of the uh, on top of the different lower layer, different layer three connections. Um, Another area of work here is transport service and interfaces. Um, so how can we take, how can we support transport innovation and the development, deployment of the existing diversity that we have in the present internet, right? So one of the problems with MPTCP is this using a TCP option for additional signaling and band. It turns out that that's actually kind of hard. Um, there are a lot of assumptions that different boxes in the internet make about uh, the traffic flowing over them. Uh, that meant that MPTCP spent a lot of its time and a lot of its effort on um, actually being able to get this option through and being able to handle cases in which middle boxes were interfering with its signaling. Um, so one approach to this uh, problem is now in the transport services working group. Um, and here we have this whole list of, of transport protocols, um, TCP, UDP, DCCP, SCTP, uh, a few others. Um, and you'll notice that each of these have sort of more or less the same words in their um, 
in their long and wordy descriptions of the services that they provide. Um, the idea behind um, the TAPS working group is maybe as an application developer, you don't want to say, oh, well, I want to use SCTP, I want to use DCCP. Maybe you just want to say, well, I want um, something that's connection oriented versus connectionless. Um, I want something that is um, uh, reliable versus best effort, so on and so forth. And you can then, instead of saying, I'm going to use this particular protocol, you can say, I need a protocol with the following, um, that will provide me the following services. And then there's this interlayer that makes that selection. So the transport is selected based on the intersections of the requirements defined in terms of the services that each of the protocols provides. So that's sort of the top side. At the bottom side, um, we have some of these protocols will work, some of these protocols won't over, over certain, um, uh, certain paths in the internet. So you can also, at the same time, dynamically measure the path to determine which protocols and options will work, and then you take the intersection of what you want and what you can get through the internet, select that, and then that's what's used for the transport. That work is going on um, actively right now in the transport services, uh, or TAPS working group, um, which is more or less just getting started. By the way, if anybody has any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, congestion control, uh, as we've said on several occasions, is a um, uh, sort of one of the core things that the transport area does. Um, and the problem here uh, is that it's common in any system that uses uh, retransmission for reliability to end up in a uh, congestive collapse state. Um, so if you have a reliable transport protocol that then will um, retransmit any lost packet, and the loss rates uh, are dependent on how much traffic is going through, so how much congestion, con if congestion causes loss and congestion is signaled by loss, uh, and you're not careful about how you do retransmission, um, you end up in a state uh, where traffic becomes dominated by retransmission. So each flow says, okay, well, I need to retransmit, I need to retransmit again, I need to retransmit again, I need to retransmit again. And your, do your good put is dominated, um, uh, well, your good put is zero. Uh, you're dominated by retransmission, and you have a network that is sending a whole bunch of packets um, that are just going to get dropped um, because they're retransmissions, and they're, they're causing the queues to fill up further and further and further. This is, is actually, the reason that we care about this is that it happened repeatedly um, in the 1980s. Uh, the um, uh, TCP uh, protocol then basically was using the, um, had only a single window, a receiver uh, side control window for saying, okay, well, I'm not going to send data when the system on the far end is not ready for it. There is no um, facility for saying, I'm not going to send data when the network is not ready for it. Um, so the result was the development and deployment of TCP congestion control, which uh, essentially limits the rate of um, uh, sending packets into the network and does this repeated probing to figure out what the state of the network is. So anybody who's, who's looked at sort of how TCP works has seen this sawtooth diagram. And the sawtooth diagram is the, um, the congestion window. So the um, amount of uh, traffic that the sender is essentially saying for each flow can be in flight at any given time. Um, and the way that this works is there's something called slow start, which um, is uh, really actually quite badly named um, because in slow start, you're increasing your sending rate exponentially and in congestion avoidance, you're increasing your sending rate linearly. Um, but this is what they're called. And uh, I actually, do you have any insight as to wh whose fault that is, David? <laughs> no, but Allison might. <laughs> so Allison, how did slow start get named slow start? Huh? Oh, because it starts with one packet. Oh, and then it's two packets, and then it's four packets, and then it's eight packets. Okay, fair enough. And then eventually you're up here. Um, so yeah, this is, this is one of when I teach TCP to people. This is one of the, the, the first questions I get is like, well, slow start looks pretty fast. Yes, yes it is. Um, so congestion control uh, initially was based just on loss signaling, um, and the widely deployed algorithms on the internet use loss as a congestion signal. Um, by loss signaling, we mean a, the congestion window here, when the congestion window reduces, when it, it detects a congestion event, it detects a congestion event because it's detect, it detected that a packet has been lost and must be retransmitted. So every time a loss happens um, and is detected, the congestion window goes down and then it goes back into this, uh, into this uh, linear probing uh, in the congestion avoidance phase. Um, there are a few problems with this. If you're using loss as a congestion signal, you're going to underperform on lossy links. So the assumption that was made in, congestion in using loss as a congestion control signal is that the only reason that you lose a packet is due to congestion. While there are other um, 
uh, physical layer links and, and uh, link layer links that will actually cause loss to occur um, for reasons other than congestion, right? If you're on a radio link and you're in, a, in an area where you have bad radio coverage, then you can see uh, uh, a, uh, so you can see much more loss. Um, if there's something wrong with sort of a cable, you can see much more loss. And you'll have, um, when you're using uh, loss as a congestion signal, you're going to underperform on lossy links, because every time you see a loss, you say, oh, the network must be congested, I'm going to back off. And every TCP sender then backs off. So if you're on a lossy link, the, the, the total good put goes down. The second problem, and one that we um, spend a fair amount of time on, uh, has, has everyone here heard the words buffer bloat? Does anyone know what buffer bloat is? Does anyone not know what buffer bloat is? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you're ingesting, inducing congestion to determine available bandwidth, right? So now, so not only is loss going to um, cause you to reduce your rate, but you're going to increase your rate until you see a packet loss, right? So the, the way that TCP uses new bandwidth um, when that bandwidth becomes available is that in this congestion uh, avoidance state, if more bandwidth is available, it's just going to keep probing linearly until it finds that bandwidth. Um, which means that if you're going to, uh, that means every so often you induce loss. So if you're inducing loss um, in a network where you have really, really large buffers, so if you have, if the, the underlying network layer and the, um, the link layer are said, okay, well, Dropping packets is bad, right? I mean, we want to get the pack, we want to get the packets through, and we have buffers, and we can have very large buffers because memory is cheap. So I don't want to be the device that's losing a packet, so I'm just going to buffer every um, uh, every packet as long as I can, and it will eventually get through, and that's good. The problem is, is that now the amount of time it takes TCP to react to changes in the network goes way, 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 way up. Um, so if you have these buffers that are sized to prevent loss, um, TCP performance goes down. Um, a third problem, uh, which is, if you hear the term, uh, which gets bandied about in transport a lot, uh, TCP friendliness, uh, is that loss-based TCP traffic will always eventually use as much bandwidth as it can, right? So it's going to keep, um, as long as the application is sending, it's going to keep probing, the congestion window is going to keep going up. Um, it's going to keep putting packets into the network. Um, so if you're designing protocols that are going to share a link with loss-based TCP traffic, you need to take the, um, uh, the behavior of TCP into uh, consideration. Um, there's a fair amount of current research in this in the Internet Congestion Control Research Group. That meets tomorrow morning. Um, and there is a, another working group that's looking specifically into um, congestion avoidance techniques for RTP, real-time transport protocol media. So. Um, in this case, you're looking at, uh, at new algorithms for doing browser-based conferencing using WebRTC. And here, the area of interest is instead of using this loss uh, signal to signal congestion, uh, you're using the change in delay, right? So you understand that there are these buffers that are uh, through the network. The, the closer and closer you get to congestion, the longer and longer uh, packets are going to stay in those buffers. So there's actually a, um, a second parameter you can measure other than, ooh, I lost a packet. The other parameter you can measure is, well, the delay um, the round trip time is changing because there are more and more packets in this buffer. Um, so uh, this is looking at, at delay changes and congestion signal. There's been a lot of research in um, uh, delay sensitive congestion um, control algorithms for many, many, many years going back um, to the first time that we tried to run TCP on wireless links and that were quite lossy and it performed really, really horribly. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll take that. Go talk a little bit about AQM. So Brian talked a little bit about uh, buffer bloat, and that's been the motivation for current work in AQM. We might as well go go back and start with so the history of active queue management. Uh, when when uh, network routers were first developed, um, people put queues in them. Hopefully, got the queue size reason, reasonably well, but the queue had a fixed size. If you overran the queue, it just started dropping. It just started dropping packets. And if you remember what I said earlier, that um, how the queue behaves and how the transport protocol behave operate together as a system, there were some bad interactions because everything is fine, all of a sudden everything is not fine. You get better behavior if you have a smooth transition. And so that was the original insight behind active queue management and led to the red algorithm, which says, it originally stood for random early discard, now stands for random early detection, where you want to start 
dropping packets for congestion before you have to, which gives everybody some time to react, and we might just settle down to a reasonable operating point. Um, improving when to drop and when not to is a research topic, and now what's happened is that uh, whereas before, back when this work was first done, uh, the problem was buffers in network gear that were too small, the hardware people have gotten very, very good. Silicon's gotten cheap. Now we have buffers that are too large. And so there's quite a bit of work going on in the Active Queue Management Working Group to augment what's going on so that we can control the size of the standing queue that we built up. Because left, left to itself, with a very large queue in a router, if, you're, if TCP is transmitting faster than the bottleneck network link can receive, it will fill every single queue in front of that bottleneck and your latency will be something you don't enjoy. The AQM Working Group uh, is working on schemes that can do better than that. Uh, Coddle, FQ Coddle, I think, I think, I think, I think in fact, FQ Coddle is now preferred to Coddle, and Pi are two of them. By all means, if you're interested in this, please take a look at that working group. Uh, now, the next thing we get to is something called ECN, Explicit Congestion Notification, which is, I went through the entire last slide and sort of hinted at this. Uh, so far, we've been talking about if you want to signal congestion, drop a packet. Well, explicit congestion notification started from a real simple uh, idea. What if, instead of dropping the packet, since we're going to do this before the queue is full, and we can probably still send the packet, what if we mark it and said, hey, things are getting bad out here. I would have dropped this, but I'm, I'm going to be nice this time. Explicit congestion, congestion notification does about that. It marks the packet. It says, I would have dropped this. And then TCP, which is, which is what it was originally uh, hooked up to, reacts as if the packet had been dropped. And the result is you never drop a packet. The rate adapts to the rate of traffic adapts to the congestion conditions in, in the network. Uh, and everything is all fine and dandy most of the time. Occasionally, things get bad. In the worst case, if, uh, if the queue really does get overrun or you have traffic in the queue that's not responding to these signals, you still drop uh, packets. There's work going on. ECN is looking like a very useful general mechanism because it, in effect, provides a means for the network to tell the endpoints, what's going on out here now? How am I doing on queues? How am I doing on traffic? Can you send me more? Can you, uh, uh, should, 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 you, should you send me less? In addition, we're working to, to try to uh, increase deployment. Brian, in particular, has been done, done, done quite a bit of work in surveying what happens when you actually try to use ECN in the network out there. Do you want to say anything more about that? Or? Um, uh, the TLDR on that is that it's um, way less broken than it used to be. But there's still work to be done. Uh, actually, there'll be a presentation on that in ICCRG in the morning if this is interesting to you. Cool. OK. So this is a where you are slide. We've talked so far about the core transfer protocols, dish control, and queue management. Now we're going to start uh, shifting into some smaller topics and probably moving through them a little bit faster. Uh, our next two victims are NAT, Network Address Translator Traversal, and UDP Encapsulation. OK, let's talk about Network Address Translators and uh, middle boxes such as firewalls. Uh, I need to quick, quickly explain what these do uh, before, I, b before I put the rest of the slide up. Um, so what a network address translator does is it translates IP addresses. More importantly, it translates ports, TCP ports and UDP ports. The primary economic motivation for deployment network address translators is they allow a whole bunch of users, say home users on, uh, on, on a, uh, on, say, uh, a, a DSL network infrastructure or cable network infrastructure to share IP, uh, to share, I, share IP addresses. So there's always the translation going on, and they're doing port translation so that if everybody starts up uh, HTTP sessions, they get translated onto different ports by, by the translator box so we know whose session is whose. All right, well, what's the story here? Um, well, back in 2011, what have we done so far? So this is a slide I've swiped from 2011. Where do you think we are on this, on, on, on this slide? <laughs> Some people are, in fact, still there. In any case, many thanks to Yana, Yana, to, to, to Yana Ayengar. Or I think it's Jana, is it? Yana. 
Jana Iyengar, this is the single best slide I have ever seen at any IETF meeting. I swipe from the best. Anyhow, we have gotten to acceptance. We have done quite, or, or some form of it, at least some of us have gotten there. We have done quite a bit of work on, uh, on NAT traversal. The initial work was protocol specific. Um, I was involved in some of the work to do uh, uh, net address traversal for Ike. Uh, this is the key exchange and negotiation protocol for, uh, for IPsec. Now, the, uh, quite a bit of, of infrastructure has been built that's protocol independent. This comes under the heading of stun, turn, and ice. I'm not going to go read all of this. The key thing to understand about this, this uh, traversal is a concept called pinhole punching, which is if I'm sitting behind my browser and I want to talk to a website, I've got to punch what's called a pinhole. I need the port, the local port that I'm using to be visible on the other side of the NAT so that when the, so that when the website responds to me, the traffic can in fact, get, can in fact uh, get, get, get back to me. All these protocols are designed to punch pinholes and maintain them. Um, the really interesting one here is TURN, which is that when both, um, both, both uh, ends of the connection are behind NATs, you need two pinholes. And each pinhole could be punched if the other one was already there. That doesn't work very well. So what TURN does is it drops a server out on the public side of the internet and uses that server as a relay to get both, to, 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 to get both pinholes punched. Um, it actually works quite effectively, uh, so much to the point that we now have a working group that's actually working on uh, improving turn, uh, security improvements, uh, better discovery of that server that's got to be out there to punch both pinholes and IPv6 support. Our other topic, UDP encapsulation. Well, NAT traversal motivates UDP encapsulation. Because you want to design a brand new protocol, well, that's nice except NATs understand TCP, UDP, and not a heck of a lot much else. There's an awful lot of, of deployed gear out there, firewalls where they have similar problems, that TCP goes through fine, UDP goes through fine, ICMP maybe, other layer four protocols, not likely. So UDP works, it's simple. It's datagrams um, with, uh, with port multiplexing, um, so it enables you to get through NATs. The other thing that, that, that UDP is used for is the same class of engineering work that was done on, done on NATs and firewalls was done on, uh, was, was done on multipathing. Uh, router equal cost multipathing, what's called link aggregation uh, for, for Ethernet. Again, there's a lot of gear out there that understands how to spread flows across links if the flows are TCP or UDP or TCP or UDP and therefore, people want to put stuff in UDP so they can, they, they, they can spread the flows out. So far, so good. UDP is a, is a reasonable mechanism for getting stuff where it wouldn't go otherwise and for getting these multipath uh, mechanisms to do something useful. However, there are a couple, at least a couple of pitfalls. Congestion control. Uh, UDP doesn't have any. It's this very simple, um, uh, unreliable protocol, does port muxing, what you give it, it sends. Thunk. Be careful. And CRC 54, CRC 5405 for the long story, there's a 5405 BIS draft in uh, the, the, the Transport Area Working Group. The other one, and I've got the exquisite scars from this, UDP checksum for IPv6. Once upon a time, when IPv6 was being designed, people looked at the links and said, wait a minute, we're running over Ethernet, and stuff like that. There's a CRC down there. Why do we need a header checksum? The answer is, uh, the, the, why do we need a header checksum? There's a link checksum, there's a, link, there's a stronger link protection down there. We will not have corruption problems. You, what you go in will either come out or the Ethernet, CRC, whatever we've got will, will protect us. All is fine and dandy. But they forgot about the things that hook the links together. They're called routers. They tend to strip link checksums. They're not always built out of the most reliable parts. They've been known to corrupt things. The upshot is that you also need something else to protect the IP packet while it's going through the router. And we've learned this, I think, the hard way in 2020 hindsight. IPv4 has a, has a, has a header checksum, IPv6 doesn't. Okay, well the saving grace here is that UDP has a header checksum and the UDP checksum actually protects uh, the IP header. It's got what's called a pseudo header factored into it. That's the good news, the bad news. 
It also protects the entire UDP uh, payload, so you've got a whole lot of calculation to do. And it's in the header, so it breaks pipelines. So I'm trying to build a hardware pipeline. Um, I've got to scan the whole packet, after which I put this in the header, only after which I can transmit. Hardware designers will tell you, will, 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 will tell you why this doesn't work very well. The designers want to zero out the UDP checksum. The upshot is it's okay to zero out if one is very, very careful. This word is in red and underlined for good reasons. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of references there to read if you're thinking about this. Another thing to keep in mind on UDP encapsulation is quality of service may operate on UDP flows, not the encapsulated flows. So if I take a whole bunch of flows, maybe browsers doing audio and video and trying to pass some data and encapsulate all in one UDP session, my QoS might be session wide. That's a discussion about uh, quality of service. Did you want to put anything in it edgewise, Brian, before I, I launch into this one? Launch into quality of service. Okay, quality of service. So general quality of service frameworks live in the transport area. Um, we've got uh, two general ones and a number of derivatives. First is integrated services, aka, AKA InterServe. Uh, this is uh, per flow quality of service, requires per flow state, doesn't scale very well. The other is differentiated services, which puts a traffic class in the IP header. There's, in fact, a six-bit field, and although I think in practice we're probably using at most three or four bits, and there's some networks that are probably using closer to two uh, if they're doing it at all. Very limited number of, of, of traffic classes. Now, these come with variants. For example, pre-congestion notification um, is built around some of the ideas from, uh, uh, from, from DiffServe, but it's doing, dealing with real-time non-congestion congestion, uh, responsive uh, flows to control, and mostly based on, initially based on initiation control. Quality of service signaling. Uh, we have a general protocol called RSVP, the Resource uh, Reservation Protocol, that's used to do signaling. It was originally invented for, uh, for, for InterServe. It's been adapted to a variety of other uses. It can be used for diff server, it can be used for PCN. The most common use for RSVP is, in fact, over in the routing area. RSVP is used for traffic engineering signaling setup of, of uh, MPLS paths. Uh, so this is an example of something you see very often in the IETF. If you develop a technology in one area, it'll get used for things you never anticipated. And so we try to get, get things done in a general fashion so that, so that they're reusable. Most quality of service work has been completed. Uh, there's limited deployment maintenance going on in uh, quality of service. Uh, diff server and RSVP, the extent that we're doing work on, are handled in the TSVWG. Although we've had some recent excitement, which still isn't quite over yet, um, differentiated services for WebRTC. That's web-based real-time conferencing. You'll see it in the RTC web working group here. It's about you and, you and me having a real-time multimedia audio-video conference, possibly with, with, with trading some data slides back and forth on the side, browser to browser. So that's WebRTC, audio, video, and data between browsers. As I sort of alluded to earlier, network address translation has got to work with this protocol. There's just way too many NATs. Most of the home, bo home uh, boxes that uh, you know, service providers uh, give to you to install, you know, four, four ports or eight ports hooks to the outbound uh, link to get to the internet, there's typically a NAT in, in, embedded in that thing. So NAT traversal has got to work. And the goal here is to minimize pinhole punching and maintenance. I said a little bit earlier about what a pinhole was. Punching one takes work, keeping it open takes work. Um, it's more complexity, you, you've got to do it. Pinhole is needed for each local port used. So why don't we just put everything in one port? Uh, put different types of having the same port. UDP encapsulates for a way to do this. Okay, that's nice. How do we now get QoS per traffic type? It turns out of the traffic types uh, listed there, audio is the most important. At it, As I ramp the drop rate up, humans notice audio problems first. There's an awful lot of stuff video codecs can use, and if the data doesn't show up for a little while, you're fine. So you'd really like to say when the going gets tough, get the audio through first because that's going to most affect the user's quality experience. That leads to a question. When is it okay to vary quality of service within a five tuple? And about a year ago, I sat down with a bunch of people from uh, the WebRTC and the working groups. We started asking this question. We didn't know the answer. Um, well, since then, uh, we've built the answer. The answer is only when the transfer protocol is UDP, and even then, only with care. It's, there's still a bunch of ways. There's still a bunch of ways to get it wrong if you're not paying attention. In particular, if you ever take one 
uh, media flow or what, uh, uh, or, or what RTP would, would probably call a source stream and try to start varying QoS inside of it in a way that causes reordering. Eventually, even RTP gets annoyed with you. In, in general, keep in mind that the network may remove all this QoS differentiation or decide that it's only going to deal with a five-tuple and the fact that you were doing something clever inside the five-tuple five is your problem, not the network's problem. Uh, see this draft, it came out of the Dart working group, diff server applied to real-time transports, which ran for about two IETF mini cycles last year, recently completed uh, cross-area activity between uh, the Rye and TSV areas. So even though we were, we were split apart quite some time ago, we can still work together quite productively. Okay, I get this next one because it's my day job, storage networking. And then, I'm, then I may give it to Brian to see, see if he can finish off the other topics. So, as I mentioned, I work, I, I work for EMC. We're so glad you send all these bits around the network because we're very, very happy building, building large boxes to store them. Um, those large boxes um, speak a couple of classes of protocols. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the work that goes on IETF. Storage networking itself could be an entire tutorial. In fact, I think I've given one uh, at Nanog at one point in the past. And for all, having said that, the Azure team will, will, will watch the video and invite me to come, come do it here. There's two primary classes of storage networking uh, which have to do with abstraction. They're called block and file. Block, which we call STAN, storage area networking, is about, in essence, providing access to what looks like a disk over the network. iSCSI and FCIP are the two uh, protocols developed in the IETF to do that. When you run one of these protocols, your operating system thinks it has a disk, and when you access the disk, it goes down the networking stacks. Uh, iSCSI, uh, is, is the example here, starts speaking iSCSI over to another box, which actually has the data and responds to the reads and writes uh, the operating system is generated when, 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 when you start running a uh, say, say, say Word or some kind of uh, uh, other application against, uh, against a file. These protocols were developed to take these kind of storage networking, which existed for, for much smaller, uh, effectively dedicated networks, and apply them to, uh, to uh, TCP IP technology. They were done in cooperation with the storage standards bodies. Uh, everything is listed here. Uh, T10 and T11 are historical acronyms. They don't expand to anything interesting. Don't ask or how we got to the number 10 because I can't really answer. The, can't can't really explain that one either. Um, we do a little bit of work to the extent that these protocols need any work. They're done in the storage maintenance working group, which uh, last year turned out a new version of the iSCSI protocol. Uh, storage maintenance working group is running out of things that need to be maintained, which is a very good sign. It suggests we got these protocols right. Um, and so on and so forth. Okay, other class of storage networking is file storage. And here, NAS, Network Attack Storage, is what the storage people use to talk about it. Um, NFS, the Network File System, is, uh, is the protocol that was worked on in the IETF to do this. And here, as opposed to the operating system thinks it's accessing a disk, but the data's on the other side, the operating system thinks it's accessing a file, and the file's over on the other side on a file server. Uh, NFS uh, v3 was brought into the IETF and standardized, then NFS v4 4 was, was developed as a new protocol that has been standardized. We've currently been working on dot versions. We're now up to NFS v4.2. And before somebody asks me, what about the other protocols out there, CIFS and SMB, which are the file sharing protocols generally spoken natively by Windows systems, those are not IETF protocols. They are, however, considered to be uh, NAS protocols. One more piece of related work, and then, 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 then we can stop talking about, uh, talking about my, my day job. RDMA protocol suite. RDMA stands for Remote Direct Memory Access. And the basic idea is that when you're accessing a file or a disk over the network, you're probably moving a lot of data. It'd be really, really nice to have the data, the data flow from memory to network to network to memory without having to bounce it off the processor at either end of the connection. Inside a single uh, 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 computer like this one, the disk access wor works that way. Data moves to or from the disk directly, directly between memory and the disk, like with your processor. That's called DMA, direct memory access. So our DMA is remote direct memory access. Just hook this together back to back over the network and get data flow. 
protocol suite for this is called, uh, is called iWARP. It was done in the RDDP, Remote Direct Data Placement Working Group, which has concluded it's often used with storage protocols, the most important of which is ICER, iSCSI extension to RDMA, which hosts iSCSI over RDMA. Okay, and with that, let me go hand it back to Brian to talk about uh, the wonders of delay tolerant networking. So in delay tolerant networking, we're talking about the question of how do we extend the internet to very high delay, low connectivity environments. And by very high delay, low connectivity, I don't mean a lossy buffer bloated router. I mean um, a, uh, a network where you're talking about seconds to minutes to hours of delay, where you may have very short windows of connectivity over time. So um, uh, a lot of this sort of started in interplanetary networks. How do you, uh, the, the, the the primitives were from how do you have a data network that talks to a space probe that you're only going to be able to see for certain periods of time where you have um, uh, minutes or hours of, of light speed delay out to something in the outer reaches of the solar system. But it turns out that the general sort of, uh, the basis for this is useful in a lot of other uh, circumstances. So um, disaster recovery, uh, you know, you have a, um, an area where all the cell service is out, but you need to be able to give handsets to the people who are first responders. How do you set up a network for that where you're essentially hopping messages or, or data packets from, from device to device? Um, UAV networks, so um, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, you can build networks of these where you have intermittent connectivity because they're flying um, on uh, certain paths and they'll go in and out and in and out of range to each other. Um, underwater acoustic networks, it turns out you have sort of the same, uh, the same area where you have, uh, or the same, um, uh, characteristics uh, where you'll have like relatively low bit rate where you may or may not have connectivity over these, uh, over these um, acoustic channels. Um, so uh, TCP won't work at all in this situation. IP will, I mean you have, have essentially a stack with, um, uh, uh, with datagrams moving around, but TCP has sort of some built-in assumptions about um, how fast the ACK is going to come back, and the ACK is clocked, and you, you can't really build a stream over this. It turns out you also need sort of a, a different applications. The applications themselves have to get involved in the timing of the messages moved around. So there was a delay tolerant networking research group uh, which defined a set of parental, so bun, uh, bundle and LTP. LTP is a, um, a Linklater transport protocol uh, named after, I forget his first name, James Linklater? Um, one of the or original pioneers of the ARPANET um, and recently we've taken this work from the research group and have moved it into a working group. This is another, uh, like multipath TCP, this is another um, uh, bit of work in the IETF that started off as an experiment. Uh, this was within a research group and so there's the um, RFC 5326, there's a RFC for bundle as well, um, that were defined explicitly as experimental. Uh, and now, especially with the growth of these new application areas, um, we're looking at uh, taking implementation experience and supporting sort of new use cases, taking these experimental documents and um, publishing them as standards. Um, and now we're going to go very fast from topic to topic to topic because now we're down in the miscellaneous um, bit. I, I drew the nice card here. Um, so uh, Alto, application layer traffic, op uh, transport optimization, traffic optimization actually, isn't it? It's application layer traffic optimization. I believe yeah, so. it's probably traffic. Yeah. <laughs> um, App, app layer T optimization um, basically is looking at solving the problem of you have uh, something that looks like a CDN or a peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol where you have data that's available in multiple places. Um, and you'd like to find the closest node or the best node based on the cost of the network um, to get a certain chunk of data from. Uh, so here, this is a, a standardized mechanism for taking two maps, a, a, a network map, which is um, uh, essentially where the partition and group endpoints, how, how does the topology look, and then a cost map, which is information about um, the costs between each node. Um, and then these can be pulled together uh, in order to give you an idea of where you should go to get the information. This is all in RFC 7285. Um, network performance measurement, this is getting close to my day job. Uh, so in, in measurement, we, we say very often you can't manage, or you can't manage what you can't measure. This is not just an internet measurement thing. This is a, this is a, a general management topic, actually. Um, so for a very long time, we've had in the IETF the IP performance metrics working group, the IPPM. Um, here we're uh, focused on two uh, general areas. We're focused on standard metrics for um, internet transport performance, because you can't manage what you can't measure, and you can't measure repeatedly what you can't compare. 
right? So everybody needs to use the same metrics and the same methodologies for using those metrics so that the numbers come out. Uh, if I get, you know, that my, um, my loss percentage is this uh, many percent in this uh, network or in this situation, and I get that measured with different equipment or uh, different software, we need to have a standard definition of the metrics so that the, the, the numbers come out uh, together. And then there's also methods to measure metrics and analyze the results. Um, this has been a very long um, uh, running working group. Uh, there's a couple of protocols that have come out of this, uh, OAMP and TWAMP for one-way active measurement protocol and two-way active measurement protocol, uh, which are used for a, a wide variety of metrics. The, mostly it's the big three, it's connectivity, loss, delay. Um, but there's been a recent focus on uh, taking some of this work and applying it to verifying access link performance, right? So. Um, uh, governments and regulators have an interest in uh, making sure that uh, ISPs are actually providing the performance that they're advertising, right? So, so bandwidth in particular is a unit of commerce now. You know, so and so many megabits per second per month uncapped will cost you so and so much money. And this becomes sort of a part, part of sort of the regulation of trade. Well, now the, uh, the regulators are interested in making sure that um, uh, you're actually getting what you're paying for. Um, so there is a, the uh, LMAP working group, which is in the ops area, which stands for Large Scale Measurement of Broadband Performance. Um, I'm guessing they're taking the, I think it was originally access performance, um, but uh, the, 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 the full name of, of the, the working group doesn't actually expand to the acronym. Um, uh, follows on uh, the uh, FCC's Measuring Broadband America, uh, but there's also European uh, projects, European regulators interested in this as well. Um, Within IPPM, uh, the current work is in a simple metrics registry for com comparability, so basically being able to, to say not just if you want to run this test, read this RFC and implement it, but if you want to run this test in a way that we're going to com compare it simply, go to this RFC and implement it with these particular parameters. Um, and then new methods for bulk tra transfer capacity measurement, because it turns out that actually figuring out, you know, the thing that we think of as um, as the easiest thing to measure in the world would be bandwidth. How much, how, how, how much traffic can you put down a pipe? It turns out that actually doing that in a way that, that, that fits into the sort of the rigor of the uh, metrics that we have defined in IPPM is really, really hard. Um, so this is one of, the, one of the big areas of current work, and I see that Matt is in the room. <laughs> if you're interested in that, go talk to Matt. He'll tell you how hard it is. Um, also responding to current developments, uh, uh, many of you in the room may be aware of the fact that um, there's quite a bit of mass surveillance going on in the internet. Um, and uh, in order to improve the security of many of these connections, uh, we say, okay, well, we're going to put TLS on everything, right? And there's been a lot of, of move to move um, the web to, from HTTP to HTTPS, uh, efforts to uh, make uh, it much easier to get certificates so that it's much easier to do the uh, operations and management side of making this easier. There's actually a boff in the security area called ACME uh, this week working on that. Um, but all of this requires application support. All of this requires the application developers to go and say, okay, well now I'm going to um, uh, be TLS enabled. You would then have to do the management of the certificates and the management of the, uh, of the trust chain, so on and so forth. Um, and we still have this need to pr improve confidentiality and privacy even without the rewriting all of the applications. Uh, so here we're looking in the TCP increased security or TCP Inc uh, working group. Uh, the idea here is to add opportunistic security which is zero config and not necessarily authenticated security. So, uh, so um, here we're looking at confidentiality um, that can be set up sort of um, on the fly and transparently to the application. Uh, there are several proposals here. Um, there's a TCP AO, an extension to the authentication option for TCP. There's a binding to TLS so that we can essentially use this TLS stack that's pretty much already everywhere to do this. And then there's a, another uh, project called TCP Crypt uh, that does the same thing. All of these leverage TCP options, which may or may not pass through middle boxes, may require additional option space. So one of the really interesting things uh, about sort of the trade-offs, uh, evaluating the trade-offs here is how deployable they're likely to be. Worth, worth definitely talking about that. TCP was designed from the beginning with this notion of options that you could add to TCP. For the most part, they're unused, which means there's a lot of equipment out there that doesn't understand what to do with them, doesn't, d d doesn't know what they are, 
people, people who build things like firewalls get suspicious of what they don't understand. And so TCP options are another one of those things, as Brian said, may not be deployable. Um, not, it's, in, it's in the specs, but be careful. It's not necessarily the design tool you're looking for. And there's, um, so there was, a, I, I get the, the numbers wrong, 1123 TCP extensions for high um, speed. Yeah, it was 1123. Uh, that's been updated recently. That um, uh, added uh, the window scale and timestamp options. Mm -hmm. And there was also 20 something, uh, which added selective acknowledgement. So these were all uh, options that were added to, um, uh, based on implementation experience to improve how TCP works in real life conditions and in conditions in higher bandwidth areas. Uh, the best study I've seen on the deployment of these and the deployability of these recently was um, uh, Honda et al, is it still possible to extend TCP? And looking at these extensions that had, or these options that had been defined um, now more than 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago, um, Timestamps would be negotiated by about 30% of the servers that they looked at. Selective acknowledgement and, um, and uh, window scale uh, actually fared much better. Window scale is, is available almost everywhere because it, the original um, uh, TCP receiver window is not large enough for most of the links that most devices are attached to. They're very clear. Um, uh, there are very clear incentives to deploy that. Same thing with selective acknowledgement. Selective acknowledgement makes it much easier to recover from a loss. Um, especially on one of these long links, if you're inducing a loss in order to do congestion um, uh, detection, it would be much nicer to be able to get an inf it's much nicer to be able to get information about exactly which packet got lost, and that's what selective acknowledgement gives you. So both of those are up in the 80s, but timestamps, which improve RTT measurement, are, is down in the 30s, and below that, you're into the single digits. Um, I had another point that I wanted to make there, but I completely forgot what it was. <laughs> It'll come back to me later. Keep going. So um, that basically gives the overview of all of the you know various and sundry things that we do in TSV. Are there any questions at this point before I go into um, what awaits you this week in Dallas? Sorry, that's a naive question, Dominic Martel. Um, or in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned a blocking problem with TCP, had a blocking problem. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, I mentioned something about a head of line blocking problem. Um, what happens there is a TCP maintains a, sing maintains a single sequence of of packets uh, of, of of packets packets that that um, that it's sending. And so you can get into a situation in which something has been dropped and needs to be retransmitted. And that blocks everything else behind it, because TCP runs, runs a single sequence. Well, if what we're actually trying to do, and this is what the tele telephony signaling protocol is really trying to do, we're actually trying to run about five or six or even more little tiny signaling sessions, we're just going to multiplex on top of TCP, well, the packet got dropped, um, it dropped, it blocked, it, it, we're, 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 we're going to get that that retransmitted before we make progress on delivering the rest of them. Mm, we just block the other five or six sessions, which aren't effective. We could, if we got those through, those could be delivered off of the far end. And so SCTP brings in this notion that recognizes we're actually trying to run these five or six different signaling sessions over one transport uh, transport connection, and it can arrange to deliver the stuff that's unaffected while it's dealing with what was dropped. And head of line blocking basically is, if you look at the original design for, you know, we're going to use TCP to provide a single stream, uh, something that looks more or less like a file descriptor, then you don't really run into these problems. But especially now as we're having more and more um, uh, incentive to multiplex these connections, you know, you're, you're saving that state, you're saving the problem of having to, to, to open um, holes in the net and so on and so forth. Then there are more and more applications that are, are um, that solving the head of line blocking problem come, becomes important for. Thanks for the question. Anyone else? Okay, so what are we doing this week? Um, uh, this is the wall of text acronym uh, slide. Uh, if you've seen something that we've talked about and you're uh, interested in it, um, you know, watch for it in the coming slides. But if you have no idea what any of this is, we're going to, for those acronyms we've not already expanded, um, we'll expand them on subsequent slides. So um, in no particular order, um, here's what's going on this week. <laughs> uh, so uh, the TSV area meeting is not a working group. It's an area meeting. 
Um, it's sort of all people who are interested in the TSV area get together and talk about uh, topics of general interest to the entire area. The topics in Dallas are um, the ITF area reorganization and uh, likely effects on uh, transport. Um, so there has been uh, sort of some reorganization and creeping further reorganization um, of uh, areas in, uh, in the ISG. Spencer, do you want to talk about this? I think you're probably more qualified than I am uh, and more up to date because I just missed the mass last meeting. Which thing are Um, yeah, just uh, probably for the purpose of this conversation, just letting people know that, that uh, we're working on one. And uh, what it has a lot to do with is trying to make sure that we have uh, the core transport uh, functions really, you know, that, that that clumps together and that things that are not so closely related to the core transport functions that you talked about uh, could go other places. This has a lot to do, and speaking as the current, uh, one of the two current area directors for transport, this has a lot to do with trying to make sure that uh, we do everything we can to make it possible for people who are really good candidates for uh, transport area directors to be able to serve. And part of that is making sure that uh, they're able to focus on the things that in core transport without having to also be responsible for other things that aren't related to that. Yeah, so basically what Spencer said is he wants to get rid of my working group and um, David's working group. <laughs> but he's too nice to say it. Get rid of <laughs> <a harsh> word. <laughs> so, seriously, to, to do some, 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 some more suppression, the, everybody in ISG has been very, very clear that all this discussion of reorganization is not about putting an end to work. It is about structuring things to get the work done effectively, and work that is going on will continue, will, 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 will continue to go on. Okay. Next up is Transfer Area Working Group. I'm one of the, cha I'm one, I'm one of the chairs of this. Uh, this is a catch-all working group for work that needs to be done, but that really can't sustain its own IETF working group. So SCTP maintenance extension falls in here, uh, primarily for use in WebRTC, which wants to run SCTP for the data channel in browsers and encap that in UDP, use DTLS, and I forget what else they want, but there are a whole bunch of things that they discovered that, that should be done to SCTP, and so we signed it up to do them. Working on a uh, UDP uh, guidance update, which will include considerations for multicast uh, and encapsulation. Uh, there's also a GRE and UDP encapsulation draft, which is putting some of these encapsulation considerations uh, to the test. There's some RSVP maintenance. As I said earlier, primary use for RSVP is for MPLS-based networks of traffic engineering. Whole bunch of QoS topics, circuit breakers, how to do a quality of service when I hook two networks together and they both want to speak diff serve, but neither, neither, neither is really sure it trusts the other. If you want to understand more, come, come to the Thursday session. Uh, explicit uh, condition notification application link layers, uh, some, some WebRTC usage of QoS. Uh, we're meeting twice. Uh, there's enough going on that we actually need four hours for this, uh, for, for this catch-all work, uh, which is what has me very busy this week. Okay, uh, TCP maintenance and minor extensions. This is bug fixes and moving TCP along the standards track. They're now looking at how to pick up alternative congestion control algorithms in, in a TCP Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday morning. Hope the coffee works well. Multipath TCP. Brian described this earlier. They're working on a extending TCP to run effectively over, over multiple paths. So regular TCP session uses uh, multiple paths and network without doing anything special. Keep in mind what, what I described earlier about, uh, about how multipathing works by default in the network. By default, it's going to send the TCP session down a single path period, this was about uh, doing better. So you can see the list here of, of, their current, of their current work. Basically, the protocol's been done, it's getting deployed, and so we're now at sort of a stage of consolidation. Operational experience, what do we discover in practice? Um, middle boxes, bane of everybody's existence, but fact, fact of life has to be worked on, and implementation uh, uh, guidelines. 
TCP increased security. I think Brian just covered this, so there isn't a whole lot more to be said about this. They are in the process of figuring out how they're going to go about doing this. I think I've seen drafts on at least the uh, TLS and TCP crypt approaches. I'm not sure I've seen one on AO. Uh, yeah, at this point, I think they've basically come down to, to um, asking the question, which of these two, they're starting the selection of which of the two approaches um, they're going to um, go forward with as the as the target, and those are just the TC, the um, TCP crypt and the TLS. And acronym expansion. The space is, as you probably figured out by now, is full of acronyms. AO is uh, is the TCP authentication option, uh, which was originally developed to try to develop routing protocols. Though I think I think routing is not making a whole lot of use of it these days. Okay, ICCRG. Um, Congestion control is still a research area. You've probably heard us hint at, hint at a number of unsolved problems in congestion control as, uh, as we've gone, th gone, gone through this talk. So this is where the research results get brought in. The Dallas agenda, uh, which is tomorrow morning, first thing, is congestion-related topics. This is where the researchers have a cool new idea come in and talk about IETF and get, get our attention about it, get, get, start socializing, what is it, how might it affect our protocols. They're usually out ahead of, I, ahead of IETF working groups. There have been a number of, of things we can point to that went into ICCRG and eventually flowed down into uh, working groups and transport to get uh, standardized. One of them is this. RTP media congestion avoidance techniques. This is trying to figure out how to do congestion control like things for multimedia traffic, uh, low delay and, and low jitter, reasonable bandwidth sharing, effective use of signals. And we actually have at least one ringer in the room, Mirya Kulavin sitting in, sitting in the back row is one of the chairs of RMCAT, so don't ask me, ask her. She actually knows the answers. I have, I, I have to try, try to remember, remember, what, remember what she's told me. Um, current work, it says, is, is, trying to, is, is on conditional algorithms and try, trying to figure out, uh, figure out uh, wh uh, which one to pick. Active queue management. This is the work group that originally started to deal with uh, the buffer bloat problem. Um, works on algorithms. You can see the list of one through four, one through four there uh, of, of what they're trying to do uh, to try to come up with sort of the next generation of recommendations on how queue management ought to work inside of routers. Uh, recommendations will be published soon. They're busy documenting, evaluating the algorithms, and uh, the, the most ex important examples there, Coddle, FQ, Coddle, and Pi, are mentioned on the slide Tuesday, late afternoon. Okay, so this is a where you are. We've talked about the area-wide TCP-related gestural meetings. Uh, next two are Taps and Spud. I'm going to hand this to Brian because he's been living this. <laughs> Uh, so um, TAPS, as I said, is uh, the goal is essentially to help application network stack programmers by describing an abstract interface for applications to use, to use to make use of transport services. And actually, one of the first things that we did in the working group is try to define what it is we mean when we say transport services in the first place. And I think we've pretty much um, come down on that. Uh, right now, the current work uh, at this working group meeting is um, looking into decomposing existing uh, transports into the services they provide. So. Um, this list that we had way, way back when we were talking about what are the core um, transport protocols and, you know, are they connection-oriented versus connectionless and um, how does it work with congestion control and how does it work with uh, um, uh, maintaining message boundaries and so on and so forth. Uh, like actually doing a, the, the rigorous work to take the transports that we have right now and figure out how would we be able to describe them, what would be the vocabulary of things to describe them in a way that they would be composable. Um, that's, oh, that's Monday, oops, okay. That's Monday at one in Parisian. Um, so we alluded a few times to the problem of ossification and how it makes the work of the transport area, uh, getting the transport area's work deployed in the internet hard. Um, so TAPS gives us one way to do this. So we, once we have the decomposition into existing transport, or uh, existing transports into the services, then we have uh, an API for selecting transports based upon those services, and then you have the measurement uh, of the paths of the internet uh, to dynamically determine which of these will actually work. Um, the SpudBoff takes a complementary approach to deossification of that taken by TAPS, and the idea is here is, is um, let's assume that uh, the middle boxes out there and the NATs are going to make it impossible 
um, to do anything useful on the majority of the paths with uh, new options or new ways to do transport. Um, so let's uh, take a card uh, out of WebRTC's book and build new transports uh, either in user space or in kernel space encapsulated in UDP. So the UDP or the, the WebRTC data channel is SCTP um, because we want the features of SCTP on top of DTLS because we want um, the features of DTLS. We want the confidentiality and authentication over UDP um, so that we can actually get it through NATs and middle boxes. Um, then once we've taken all of this uh, and put it in the encapsulation, we want to selectively expose transport and path information using a common substrate layer over UDP, which I think we actually have a slide on, on the approach that this uses later. Um, we're focusing in a non-working group forming BOF, so a, uh, a non-working group forming BOF basically means we're just going to get together and we're going to have a big, long, um, angry discussion with the mic lines <laughs> and uh, try and determine what the next steps are. Is this something that we need a research group for? Is this something we need a working group for? Is this something we can do in some other working group? Is it a terrible idea and we should just walk away screaming? Um, and we're going to focus on the use cases for middlebox cooperation and figuring out what the next steps are. So the, the idea here is we talk about the selective exposure of transport and path information. Um, once you've got these encapsulations so you can get things through the middle boxes, you're probably going to put things on DTLS so that the middle boxes can't mess with them anymore. Um, then you want to selectively expose information that the middle boxes might need in order to do their jobs that they would currently do by doing um, uh, deep packet inspection. Um, so the, the big focus on the, on the discussion is going to be use cases. What are the application use cases? What are the, the conditions in the network that we most need uh, a, a substrate layer like this for? Um, also, in the, the um, great battle uh, with the NATs, uh, turn and reversed and modernized TRAM is working on, again, taking um, uh, turn and stun uh, and improving them for um, so today's world, supporting IPv6, supporting DTLS, supporting web origin for use with HTTP. That's Wednesday uh, afternoon in the Far East room. Uh, NFS v4, I'm going to give that to you first. One, and then you get back. Okay. Uh, so NFSv4 is existing IDF standard for file sharing. Uh, work group is maintaining existing 4.1, uh, federated namespace and, and related specs. They're defining 4.2, which is pretty much done. Um, they're working on deployment guidance. As I said, 4.2 is basically done. Looking ahead to 4.3, for example, there's going to be additional parallel NFS layout type. And just recently, um, there's, they're, they're, they're looking at updating uh, the current uh, layout type that's used for block and volumes Thursday at 9 in Royal. And uh, hand this back to you for Alto. Um, so Alto kind of had a reboot recently. Um, so uh, the slide that uh, we showed is what is Alto, uh, and the idea is what is um, uh, what will Alto be. So this is originally looking at the P2P domain. Um, uh, so how can you select uh, how can you select the nearest server when you have um, a peer-to-peer -peer structure? And it turns out that the Content distribution networks have much the same problem. So um, the idea is to look into topology deployments and enhancements uh, for CDNs. Uh, that is Thursday at uh, 3.20 in Continental. Um, also in the CDN space uh, is uh, the CDNI working group, uh, which we didn't talk about before, um, which is set up to allow the interconnection of CDNs uh, for end-to-end -end content delivery through multiple CDNs down to end users. So the idea here is to actually do sort of a, a unified control plane for moving um, content around in CDNs. Um, this is sort of based on there was a set of requirements, and then there's a framework, and then there's a set of uh, interface definitions, and then the protocol implementations. So right now, they've got the framework complete, and they're working on the interface definitions on which those protocols are going to be built. Uh, that's Wednesday after lunch in Far East. Um, DTN, as I said, is working on uh, uh, updating bundle LTP and taking them onto the standards track. The work uh, currently is on use case evaluation, so looking at some of these new applications like um, inter-UAV uh, communication. Uh, that'll be Thursday afternoon in Oak. Um, and then IPPM. Uh, again, as I said, here we're looking at um, uh, defining metric registry and bulk transfer metrics for LMAP. Um, there's also a lot of current work on sort of taking work that we've been doing over time and moving it forward. Uh, so there are a few um, uh, work items right now on doing 
uh, maintenance and adding additional features to OAMP and TWAMP, and also to advancing basic metrics along the standards track. So the, the, the older metrics that we have, the loss and delay metrics, um, we have actually quite a bit of information or uh, implementation experience with those. So we're taking that implementation experience and folding them into new revisions of the documents. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer streaming protocol uh, basically has signaling and control protocols for peer-to-peer -peer streaming, basically. So there's the tracker and then the data protocol, I believe. Um, and the base tracker protocol uh, in this is nearly done. That's Tuesday at 1 p.m. in Royal. Um, TSV working groups are, that are not meeting in Dallas, there's the congestion exposure working group, um, which uh, essentially uses ECN signaling, uh, feeds back ECN signaling for um, exposing information about where the congestion is back uh, to the, or back along the path. Um, so it's not just the, sender, or the, the sending and receiving endpoints to get the information about the congestion. And then the storage maintenance working group, because as David said, uh, they basically maintain storage and are done. There's not much to do. I mean, they're not, you're not closing, but you're... Um, Sooner or later, in absence yeah. <laughs> of work, the AD is going to insist, in, insist that we close. <laughs> So that's where we are today. Uh, let me talk a little bit about um, what might be happening in the future. Uh, so I alluded to this a lot, that this, um, this ossification is one of the themes that keeps coming up uh, over and over again in uh, the work of the transport area. Um, and the problem is, is that we have all of these protocols and we develop them all for a reason. They all work on, on um, their own use cases, right? So there is, there is a reason that DCCP is different than UDP is different than UDP Lite, although they're all um, best effort um, uh, datagram protocols. Uh, but if you look at traffic on the internet, it's increasing, it primarily runs over TCP. Um, DNS is NTP and uh, uh, I think there's a little bit of uh, NetBIOS NS there's DNS, um, there's uh, BitTorrent, uh, BitTorrent uses UTP uh, for an increasing number of flows. Um, but for the most part, this is kind of what the stack looks like today. It's you have IPv4, IPv6, uh, still a lot of IPv4, but a respectable amount of IPv6, and you have TCP, TLS, and HTTP. And then a bunch of stuff just runs over HTTP because when you're developing an application sort of in the web world, um, you're running inside the browser. The browser gives you HTTP, it gives you WebSockets. Um, it gives you, um, you're probably going to be encrypted if you care about, um, if you care about uh, privacy and security there. Um, and that means that you're running over TCP. So whatever application you're running up here has the transport layer um, characteristics of TCP, even if that's not what it wants. Um, so this is, is a, um, uh, this is a consequence of the fact that we have, um, the transport layer is sort of squeezed between a relatively narrow interface that it has up. So. BSD sockets are great. They make the um, network look like a file descriptor. If we hadn't come up with this idea that anybody who can write a Unix program can write a network program, there wouldn't be an internet. That was, that was at the time, revolutionary. Um, but that's only half right. Uh, and then on the downside, we have the uh, middle boxes assuming the lowest common denominator traffic, which interferes with um, a lot of the other acronyms that we've talked about today, MPTCP, TCP Inc, and ECN. So what can be done? Um, the uh, IAB IP Stack Evolution Program, which I'm the lead of, um, uh, kicked this idea around for a while and said, well, okay, well, what we need to do is we need to get a bunch of smart people in a room and uh, we need to talk about it. Um, so there was a workshop that we ran in Zurich in January, not in February, um, called Stack Evolution in a Middlebox Internet. Um, and it was basically focusing on this question and how can we take this martini glass and uh, improve the situation a bit. Um, this was a, uh, a very productive work workshop. We've got uh, a couple of outputs of this. There's uh, later tonight uh, a barb off called Hops for how ossified is the protocol stack. That will be at 9.30 next to the bar. If you see a bunch of geeks running out of the bar at 9.30 and you're interested in this problem, follow them. <laughs> um, actually, that's probably not... Yeah, there might be multiple groups of geeks running out of the bar <laughs> at 9.30. Um, ask them where they're going, then follow them. Uh, another output is the SPUD uh, workshop that we talked, or the SPUD uh, BOF that we talked about before. 
Um, if you want to learn more about the uh, IAB Semi Workshop, uh, that'll be and at the IAB Technical Plenary, sort of after the main technical topic at the IAB Technical Plenary. Um, but actually, for those of you who would like to go um, to dinner early on Monday night, I can give you a little bit of a spoiler and say that I will be giving almost exactly the same talk um, to the TSV area uh, group just before the tech plenary. So if you're interested in this, come to either TSV area or the tech plenary, and we'll talk a bit more about it. Yeah. You're welcome to follow people out of bars all, and I would never discourage you from doing that, but uh, Hops is actually in here. Yeah. Uh, if, it's next to the bar. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so if, 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 you, if you follow the wrong group of people out of the bar, <laughs> then, then you, just come here. Oh, it's going to be in this room? Yeah. Oh, here, here, here. Yeah. Go to the bar at 930 and bring a beer here. <laughs> That's much easier. Okay. Ah. And beers are strong. Beers, beers are strongly recommended because they contain hops. Yes, um, at least if they're done right. Yeah, I was looking at the acronym for Spud, and I was realizing that we missed an opportunity because we have taps already, and then we have hops. We should have come up with a way to call it kegs. I don't know. Um, <laughs> So I'd like to acknowledge um, all of the people who helped out with slides. If you saw anything um, drawn up here, I don't think that David or I drew anything. Um, these were all um, uh, uh, slides or diagrams taken from um, some of the people on this list. And then uh, many of the other people on this list helped us out with reviews um, and uh, additional content. Uh, so we'd like to thank uh, Olivia Bonaventure, Sc Scott Bradner, Brian Carpenter, Vijay Garbani, Jana Iyengar, Miri Kudavind, um, Alison Mankin, and Martin Stiemening. So thank you very much. Um, if you loved it, if you hated it, um, come find us at any point in time. We are more than happy to take um, uh, criticism or praise. Um, but the um, uh, Secretariat would also like feedback uh, about there was a secretary at and the edu team would also like feedback about um, the surveys or about this um, tutorial so please do um, go and uh, type in this I mean you huh uh, that's the link they gave me that's the link they gave us that's the other session so how about typing surveymonkey.com slash s slash 9290 slash 92 transport and seeing if that gets you somewhere good? Um, actually, can we try that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> surveymonkey.com is just s 92. Didn't work? Did work. Oh, ah, yeah. What's yes, the transport link? instead of cram down. Okay. Hmm? Working on it, real time slide editing. <laughs> and we'll go fix the other bugs we found. Yay. Okay. Um, slash s slash transport. Slash s slash trans slash 92 transport. Slash 92 transport. Okay. Try that one, please. Thank you all very much. I've uh, been very patient. It's been about an hour, about an hour and a half. Uh, appreciate, appreciate your willingness to sit around and listen to us. Happy to take questions at the mic, or you can come up and uh, approach us directly. The agenda is more up to date. We had advanced deadlines of the slides. MPTCP is canceled. Why is MPTCP canceled? Why is MPTCP canceled? What's that? MPTCP is canceled? Nothing to talk about? Or? Uh, that was the quote, but I have nothing to talk about. <laughs> 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 All right. 